A Bloomberg Politics poll shows that 72% of Americans think the country isn't as great as it once was. Congressman Dan Webster, representing Florida's 10th District, joins us to discuss the challenges of leadership in these trying times, next on Metro Center Outlook. Hello, I'm Diane Trees. Lifting budget caps, extending highway funding, and raising the debt ceiling are among the items on Congress's agenda this fall. United States Representative Daniel Webster, serving his third term, is with us today to share his insights. Congressman Webster, welcome to the show. Great to be on, Diane. There has been a flurry of activity in Washington with the resignation of Speaker of the House John Boehner. You are interested in that position. Why do you feel that you would be a good fit for that role? Well, first of all, I, I served as Speaker of the House in the state of Florida, a big state, complex state, and, uh, and also I was able to transform a lot of the things that were done, the typical way a, a legislative body uh, works, and, and, and make it a whole lot better, a whole lot uh, more united, and so forth. So what we were able to do was say, we want to move from a power-based legislative body, which is where most legislative bodies are, including Congress, and that is a few people at the top of what we'll call a pyramid of power um, that are members make all the decisions. And uh, what I wanted to do and what I was able to do in Florida was push down the pyramid of power, spread out the base, so every single elected member could have an opportunity to offer an amendment, to speak, to offer a bill and participate in what uh, is called the legislative process. Uh, on the other hand, the other way is where just a few people dictate every bill that comes up and then all we become is somewhat pawns. And so that's, that's what I wanted to do. And so I call it member driven also because the members get, a, get the, the opportunity to be totally in charge of what's going on as opposed to just, again, a few people. Right, so it's member driven leadership. And the fact is that you had implemented a similar style of that leadership while you were speaker in, in the Florida State yes, Legislature. Yes, I did. Correct. And there are a lot of advantages to that. There's talk of, of of naming an interim speaker. Um, how do you feel that, is that a good way to go? Or do you think that we need to have the speaker named and, and this chaos a little bit more stabilization? Which way is better? Well, uh, an interim speaker is gonna be a lame duck speaker because the, the race will go on for the, quote, real speaker. So nothing's gonna settle. Nothing would settle down. The, the race would continue on. You just pull one person out of it, make them speaker, and you still got yeah. all the people running yeah. uh, to be speaker uh, for the next term, right. uh, which would start in January of 2017. So it would be far better just pick somebody, right. and I think that's what we're going through right now. And move forward. What's the next step for you here? Well, I'm trying to convince members that I have the best plan and, the, and would be the best person right. for the job. Right. And that's just uh, nothing like, nothing different than campaigning. You're going sort of, instead of door to door, you're going office to office and uh, phone call to phone call, just calling the members. Uh, there is uh, certainly a smaller select group of members, but they have a lot more questions right. than the general public. So and you can't do it by mail. You gotta, you gotta go see people and right. talk to them and, and convince them it's the right way to go. And I think that's your style anyway. You're a more person to person kind of. Yes. Over and, the and, years and I've I'm seen trying that. To, I'm, my, the thing I'm talking about is transforming, uh, not just making a few changes here and there, or may, even keeping it the way it is. Right. Um, the institution itself is, is what I'm battling against. It, it, institutions don't want to change. They don't, they resist change. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my battle is not with individual people who are running for speaker. My, mm -hmm. my battle is to try to convince people that a power-based structure is not good. A principle-based, member-driven structure right. is good. Right, let's talk a little bit about your past experience. I'd like to tap into your expertise. We have had a contentious situation here in the Florida State Legislature. You have 28 years of experience, leadership positions in both the House and the Senate. We've had our House walk out of a session. We've had the inability to reach compromises. Is this healthy discourse? Is this part of what makes our government work? Or is it 
tension and disruptive. What do you think about this? Well, there's nothing wrong with the debate of ideas. I mean, that's, that's part of the American opportunity. In other countries, there's only one idea that prevails, and anyone that has another idea mm -hmm. uh, is, in, in some cases, punished right. for having that idea. So I think it's good to have a debate, a discussion. However, um, it's, it's far better to have it uh, together as opposed to sort of uh, this division that happens and then maybe the two leaders get in a discussion that's, that's not, it becomes a public discussion as opposed to actually working out the right. differences. Right. And so uh, again, nothing wrong with having a position, nothing wrong with debating that and holding on to that, but there comes a time when uh, the, uh, the principle of just what's good for the state comes into effect. And I'm not saying what it, which, one, which side would be good for the state, but if there's a session and it's called, you should go and you should work to the very end to try to get uh, the answers that you need. And if you don't, then there are provisions. There are provisions for there to be a di so much discourse that, or di dis a disagreement that there might be a need for a special session. And that's all there. The governor can call that or the two percent presiding officers right. can call that, and they come and, and they work out the differences. To me, that's, uh, that's the way it is. I think that you have to have a plan that starts at the end and works backwards, as opposed to uh, starting now and working forward and mm -hmm. hoping it works out. It never mm -hmm. works that way. Mm -hmm. So I found w when I was presiding that the best way to do it was say, okay, here's the end goal. This is when we ha have to quit. Now, what are the deadlines we have to meet in order to get there going backwards? And I think that would, what would solve right. a lot of things. Right. Sometimes uh, we allow the membership as a whole to remain in the discussion for too long. Uh, what, what we had, for instance, the appropriation process. What we would do is we would let the committees and the conference committees work out the differences. Then any major issue that they couldn't work out, that would, that would kind of bump up to the subcommittee chairs then they would only have a couple of days, and if they could not work them out, then would move to the big chairs of the committee. Right. And then a few days later, it would be the two presiding officers. And doing that, it, um, it, it allowed for um, most of those issues to be dealt with by the general membership. But if it couldn't happen, then would move up in authority till you got to the presiding officers, and then they should be able to work them out. Shifting back to, to the federal level, we just had the fiscal year end um, budget crisis, which is still not resolved. You're talking about your member-based leadership versus a power-based. How might this affect um, the, the, the last minute issues that come into play that seem to hold our budget hostage. Would that make a difference, do you think? It would. The key difference in what I'm talking about is taking up the most important issues first. When I was, before I became Speaker of the House, uh, every session for 16 years was the same. We take up the least important issue. Like the, the year before I became Speaker, the first thing we did was the naming of the state pie. And we had plenty of time to <laughs> debate them. That? It's the key lime pie. But anyway, it's, it's you know, everybody has time then. Right. And then everything would work into to this exponential train wreck at the end. And it was purposeful. So you could kind of hold the members and you could make these decisions yeah. right at the end. And the problem with that is it just totally shuts out the membership. So last day, we would work all day long and they would feed us pizza and then barbecue and meatloaf kind of wear us down. And then we'd work all the way to midnight and then after midnight is when all the major issues would show up. Right. And, and really, they were all taken up in just a short period of time, 15, 20 minutes and they're done. So that, that's the wrong way to do it. Take up those most important issues and you don't have these continuing resolutions like we do in Congress right at the deadline, right before right. the government shuts down. No, we're done. We should have been done five months ago with the major issues. And then I kept all the bridge namings and road namings till the end as opposed to doing them in the, the beginning. The happy things. Yes, yes. absolutely. It does uh, seem like that that's, still, that's become more of a pattern now at the state level and in, on the federal level. Let's talk about your um, finances, your conservative frugal approach. I believe that you have returned monies twice now that were allocated to your office that you were to spend, but that you have been frugal in your expenses and didn't need them. What would you recommend to decrease the federal deficit. Any thoughts? Well, I, I think that's waste. People try to tie together fraud, waste, and abuse. Well, f fraud and abuse are against the law. Waste is not. So we're given money to run our offices here locally and in Tallahassee and hire staff and all that. We're given money to do that. 
um, I found where there was waste. It was totally proper for me to spend every dime. And that's sort of a principle. If it's appropriated, spend mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And you'll never get there if you, if you do it that way. You should reward those. I wasn't looking for a reward, but the reward those heads of agencies or bureaus or departments mm -hmm. uh, with, with some monetary uh, ability. They could keep part of the, what they save. Right. Uh, then they'll look for waste, but if they're not, they're just going to spend it all. Right. So I was able to save 30% uh, of my uh, money I was given. So at the end of this year, it should be around $2 million. Right. So it's an incentive to, to use your money wisely. You have been a champion for transportation issues throughout your political career. We're looking at a national crisis now with crumbling transportation infrastructure. What would you support for a long-range funding program? Is there one? Uh, yeah, there, there is, and there's a lot of talk about using uh, money that's been taken offshore by corporations, which avoids, it temporarily avoids, it doesn't eliminate, but it avoids a tax, which uh -huh. is a pretty heavy tax. <clears throat> What's been talked about is trying to repatriate that money by using um, a lower tax break and just say, look, if you bring your money back, we'll tax 8% or 7% or somewhere in that range, and, and you can bring your money back and use it for investment here. That would be two things that are good. One is, if they brought it back, they're gonna invest it here in, right. in, in America. The second is that tax money could be used to plug the holes in the, uh, in the Transportation Trust Fund. But I have an idea about uh, TIFIA, TIFIA loans, and interjecting new money there by uh, whoever, by, by we loan out money, and by requiring that that whatever money we loan out, it goes to a revenue producing project, like a toll road or okay. some other thing that produces more money. Then there is more money being interjected in the system. We loan money in Antifia, but it could be paid back with just existing revenue. All it does is advance the project, but it doesn't really put any more money in. Eventually, they're gonna to have to pay that back. But what I've said is, if, if we loan money, make them pay it back, make the states mm -hmm. or, or local communities pay it back, but pay, pay it back with new revenue, new as opposed to existing revenue, mm -hmm. that's more money, that's new money that's never been in the system. And that's, uh, I think that's gonna happen in this next authorization bill. Is that, did, was something similar done with the Wakaiva Parkway? Was that financed? Well, it, it did get, yes, it was financed about $173 million at a low rate, right. it's a low interest rate. Um, it's called the rural rate that they use and it, it actually advanced that project by several years and, um, and lowered the amount they'll have to pay back by a huge amount. Huh. Okay, very good. We're going to take a short break, Congressman. Great. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Congressman Daniel Webster of Florida's 10th District is our guest today. Congressman, let's talk a little bit about some funding. Um, there's, there's been discussion of reduced funding for military and defense projects. We have such a large military presence here in Central Florida Research Park, plus the modeling and simulation industry. How might that impact us? Well, I, I think it would be somewhat negative. Uh, what's happened is that funding decrease would happen uh, will happen automatically it's called sequestration and it was a it was something that was passed several years ago to say okay if we don't come to a particular uh, way to reduce the deficit then there's going to be an automatic um, uh, sequestration or holding back of funds mm -hmm. in certain areas defense was one of those areas um, I would tell you that I think there are the votes in, in, in the House of Representatives to go uh, to bypass that sequestration um, and to continue uh, funding defense at a, at, a, at a certain level as opposed to allowing it to be reduced. Right, that's critical for our area economically as it well. It is, and a lot of other areas too, and there's a lot of people that want to um, uh, just keep the funding uh, in, a, in a way that would uh, avoid what, what's called sequestration, Right. and I think that's going to happen. 
Let's talk a little bit about another area, entitlement programs. There's discussion of diverting funds from some of them, um, specifically with Medicare and Social Security. We have a large senior population, again, in our state. Um, what are your thoughts here? What's going to happen? And I know you can't predict, but, but what do you think? I think I can predict on Social <laughs> Security. I think we're going to keep our promise. Okay. I, I do not see us doing anything that would hurt the people, the seniors that are on Social Security. Mm -hmm. They depend on that money. They've counted mm -hmm. on that money. They paid into to the uh, the fund as the, when they worked, mm -hmm. and they deserve to get what they were guaranteed. And so I think that's going to happen. As far as Medicare, uh, one of the problems uh, a lot of people talk about Obamacare, they don't like it, they do like it. The subsidies that are given out come from a, uh, an amount of money that's been taken out of, uh, out of uh, Medicare. It's about $750 billion is going to come out of mm -hmm. Medicare to pay for those subsidies. A lot of us have voted a couple of times to get rid of that, to not take mm -hmm. that money from there. Uh, and so, and then there's this uh, independent payment advisory board, 15 panel board that doesn't even include uh, medical doctors that are, it, that are in Washington that are going to determine certain uh, ways uh, to lower the cost of Medicare, which really is going to turn out to be rationing. And, and so you may be a certain age and you may need a certain treatment mm -hmm. and they're going to reduce that treatment and that they're not going to give you, even though it's qualified and they're not right. going to change anything as far as the offering of that service, what they are going to do is limit uh, through other means and regulations uh, the person's access to that service. That's something also I think there, there is bipartisan support to get rid of that, what they call an IPAB, Independent Payment Advisory Board. So those are a couple of things that are out there. I think uh, there may be some legislation that makes it through the House right. that would stop some of these things that are talked about in the, in the area of Medicare. Right. I think you probably hear from a lot of people about that. If that I do. <laughs> moving forward, yes. Let's talk a little bit about foreign policy issues. You, um, w Cuba, let's start with Cuba. It's closer to home. What about the normalization of relations with Cuba? We are so close. Do you see this as positive, negative impact for Florida? Well, I think for the country, um, our job is to get the very best uh, uh, deal we can get in our negotiations. Cuba is a known violator of human rights. I mean, they have treated their people in a, a unhumane way. And for us to extend the hand to say, okay, let's open relationship, a relationship again and have uh, you know a presence there, an embassy there, and not get huge concessions on the way they've treated their people was a, was a bad move. I do. Congressman, when these kind of deals are negotiated, you know, the, the deal with Iran, and I know that there were two points that you particularly wanted to be included that weren't. Once that passes, how, how is there a possibility to renegotiate, to add anything in? What, what would cause you to support some of these? How do you go back and change anything? Well, I think the one thing is the sanctions that we had worked, and they were they were clamping down in two areas. One is they couldn't, they couldn't sell their goods uh, to a whole list of countries, but we would be the prime jewel of that. Uh, second of all, we, um, we uh, tied up their money that they had. It was their money, yeah. but it was on deposit here and in other places, and it was hundreds of billions, uh, 100, I think $150 billion total. And they were down, they were, their operating capital was going down as far as a government, and they needed that money. And because they needed it, we should have been able to just get, especially those two things. One is no intercontinental ballistic missiles. I mean, really, the only place they could fire them is here. I mean, who else is going to be in danger by that except us? And the second is, um, I, I believe that we should have been able to say inspections anytime anywhere mm -hmm. um, and, and be able to walk in and go to that place and do the inspections, as opposed to what we got was at least a 24-day delay before we, any of the inspectors, none of which are Americans, right. can go in. Second is, part of the inspections are, uh, part of the places are off limits, and so the Iranians are going to do the inspections for us and tell us if it was good or bad, which <laughs> it just seems like, why would we ever 
negotiate something like that. So, so those two things were big. I think they were um, uh, very big to uh, many of the members of Congress. The way you do that is reinstitute the sanctions. Okay, okay. Let's move a little closer to home again. We have uh, a financial crisis in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is not a state, but it has big ramifications for the nation. What are your thoughts here? Do we step in to help? Um, does it impact Florida? Is it something we need to watch? Well, if you take a look at, uh, at even what's happened in Europe, um, the other countries were willing to help, but they wanted to see uh, a plan. Right. A plan of what you're going to do differently. Okay, what you've done now hasn't worked. And it's bankrupting, in this particular case, uh, Puerto Rico. And so if, if that takes place, we've got to see something that would be uh, positive towards reducing the spending. Mm -hmm. And if, if not, uh, I think that's, what, uh, that's, that's the problem. And we're not seeing anything that would actually say, all right, we're going to step up. We're going to make these uh, uh, cuts right. to our spending. Uh, can you help us out? And I think there might be a willingness to help out if that were to take place. Right, so uh, they need a plan of action. This is what we're going to do and then do it. There, is so, there are so many things um, happening and going on. It's not just the resignation of the speaker. When you look at this, there's, you can go from every angle. Um, and I want to come back to another headline that we're seeing all the time. That's redistricting. We had our state legislature not able to reach a compromise. It's turned over to the courts. How does this affect you and your political viability? Well, the way it affects me, one, is, is my citizens keep changing and we're doing casework and trying to help them out. And so this would be, if, whenever this one's enacted, it'll be the fourth district uh, that has been drawn for me since 2010. <laughs> I haven't been there that long. This is your third term. Yes, yeah. and so uh, stability is, is good right. because you, you keep passing these files around to other offices and say Here's, here are the caseworks, hundreds of caseworks that you're working on. So that's one thing. Plus people sort of like to have stability in who their member is. Well, right. I'm your member today, but I'm not going to be right. tomorrow. Uh, or I might not be the next day. It's very, uh, or you it's might very be again, hard to understand. It makes it hard. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, hopefully they get it right this time. Right. I have to ask you, with all of your years with a distinguished career, what satisfaction do you derive from, from doing public service work that keeps you coming back, wanting to run again and again for office? Well, uh, in some cases, I was able to change public policy, which I, I thought was very, very good. And, uh, and you, there's a lot of satisfaction in that. But then, and so that's, that happens either in Tallahassee or Washington. Right. But it, locally, there's so many people that you can help. I have found that I can lend my name to, to opportunities, and it does help that organization solve problems. The federal government really is kind of a cookie cutter program uh, 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 developer. They just stamp out programs and they tell Orlando and Butte, Montana and inner city New York, here's your program, it's the same one. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. There's so many organizations here locally that, that are 501c3s that do a fantastic work and the reason is because they know the problems that are here. And they're different from other places and uh, other communities. And they put their finger on them and they go out and do everything they can to solve them. So I'm, I'm interested as a member of Congress in helping them. I, I coach a softball team uh, and we play a game and people actually show up and some celebrities play with us. And, Cross party uh, lines and, too. Yes, and they pay, and they pay, play money, and they pay money uh, in, in, uh, here locally uh, out in Claremont for the uh, New Beginnings, which mm -hmm. is the homeless uh, coalition there mm -hmm. in Claremont. And they raise money and they use it for that. I'm willing to do that if that helps them. And I have to go out and, and do, you know, not crazy things, but you know, do something. Deal with I'm some crazy things. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, I'm willing to do that in order to hopefully uh, make our communities yeah. better. And these are these organizations that do that are the ones that are really right. making this community better. Thank you, and thank you for your years of service. And great to be on. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for tuning in to Metro Center Outlook. Until next time, I'm Diane Trees.